So good afternoon, I'm my usual position is sort of bringing up the rear of the whole thing. And I'm very pleased to be asked uh, to come and talk to you. And Peter, thank you very much indeed, and also to Mike for, for organising the day. So I'm quite used to lecturing quite late in the day to a slightly dozy audience. I was speaking to medical students a couple of weeks ago. I only give one lecture now, really, but I give the lecture the whole of the second year, which in Birmingham is nearly 500 students. So it's quite an impressive lecture theatre, really. And they talk and they chat and they eat and they send emails to each other. And they sort of generally mess around. You get used to it, really. <coughs> At this time... There was a youngish lad in the front row who I suspect had quite a good evening the night before. And uh, <coughs> he wasn't really paying much attention, which isn't unusual, but then he fell asleep. He put his head on the bench, which, OK, you know, people do fall asleep while I'm talking quite regularly. Um, joy being an I suppose. But people do fall asleep. When, <coughs> and, um, well, sorry. Put his, put his head on the table, then started snoring. And I have to say, I don't think there's anything worse than actually trying to give a lecture where there's somebody snoring in front of you. So I said to the young lady next door, I said, look, do you think you can wake him up? And she looked me straight in the face. She said, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> <laughs> so the question I was asked, to some extent, really is the question about the whole day, isn't it? And clearly coming last, one of the things you don't want to do is repeat what everybody else has already said. And so I suppose if you say, will the NHS use your technology? Well, if it works and it's C, marked and you've proven value and it's of patient benefit and everything else, I suppose the honest answer is, well, possibly. Uh, <laughs> I'm absolutely honest about it, which seems a little bit cynical. And I actually quite nicely want to build on the previous talk a little bit and talk about the fact that even if you have got it through the regulations, like a little bit about that, and you have demonstrated value for money and everything else, you haven't quite necessarily broken the barrier. And I don't think it's just the NHS in all fairness. I think it's all healthcare systems. So I have a, an odd background. I've not been very good, really, at doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, so I came to Birmingham in 1986 for six months uh, as a lecturer in anaesthesia and critical care. I never quite got to going home. So I've been there nearly 33 years now. And I'm still there. I still have a clinical academic position, uh, although I stopped working clinically a couple of years ago when my back fell apart. I've been very privileged to be uh, the clinical director of what was originally one of the HTCs and now one of the MICs. I'm not going to say much more than that, except we focus on trauma. We work in similar ways, although I think we have subtle differences. Uh, and we've really enjoyed doing that, and I think it's been a very useful project. Alongside that, um, three years ago, we obtained just over uh, £7.2 million of matched funding to build a dedicated medical devices testing and evaluation centre. The slightly bigger half is University Chemical Engineering Laboratories, but I had the money to build my own dedicated centre, and I am going to talk a little bit about that because I'm completely incapable of talking about anything else uh, at the moment. So I am going to mention that at the end because I think it does sort of dovetail in a little bit into what we've been talking about today. Uh, you've heard uh, that I've been a member of Interventional Procedures for many, many years under the chairmanship of Bruce Campbell, and I have to be very honoured to be appointed to chair it uh, beginning in 2016, and I've been appointing it ever since. Uh, it's been a fantastic job. It's extraordinarily hard work uh, on the day particularly, and there's a meeting tomorrow. Um, and I have to say, I think if you are industry, you are bringing things too nice, um, please talk to them. Uh, they're extremely, they'd much, much rather talk to you than you assume they don't want to talk to you. Uh, and also, one of the things we brought in, the two things we brought in, one was to make it digital, uh, so we ran paperless. Previous chair said that would never happen. I have said it happened the next meeting after uh, we took over. We, did, we had a lot of consultation, which involved just doing it and just saying to people, that's tough, we're not going to send you a printed copy uh, and get on with it. And the other was to bring industry uh, into the meeting. So if you are bringing products to interventional procedures, you will be invited to bring your technology. Uh, you sit there during the part one. It is not a product promotion, but the uh, contextual evidence around what does it look like, how big is it, how many have been used, etc., is fantastically helpful. The evidence we will look at, as I said a minute ago, is peer-reviewed publications for efficacy and virtually anything for safety. So you can't get round by trying to do a PowerPoint presentation on the day, being blunt. And no one's ever actually tried to do that. And then also, <coughs> in a previous life, worked very part-time part for the UK Competent Authority which, Authority, which is the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, there's a lot of confusion. They don't actually issue CE marks, but they confirm Class 1 device CE marking, and they work closely with the notified bodies. So that's an interesting combination background of some original basic research. I formed three medical device companies. Uh, one did absolutely nothing. Uh, one did very well, one did very badly, uh, and the net result was about zero, really, at the end of the day. Uh, <laughs> but I had quite a lot of fun. I had some quite interesting times. Uh, trying to conceal the fact that you've mortgaged the house from your wife is not a thing I would recommend you do. Uh, <laughs> I'm honest about it. Uh, fortunately, the fact you could manage to get rid of that in time. Uh, but they are slightly worrying times, I have to say. Um, I enjoyed it at the end of the day, and I think one of the things that we developed uh, actually has turned out to be quite useful. So we've heard quite a lot about medical devices, and I appreciate most of you in the industry know the sort of facts and figures very well. But just let me just remind you 
that in Europe alone there are over 500,000 classifications of medical devices, let alone individual devices. And of course, increasingly, we're seeing digital moving into this. I would think that about a half of all the digital technology that we get to see through one of the two projects will be classed as a medical device because it has a medical claim. In a funny way, I think that's actually quite easy because then we know what the path through the regulations is going to be. It's more complex when it sits on the borderline. You heard, I think, Jeff said there are over 29,000 medical device companies. There are indeed in Europe. The average number of employees is two. Every 11 minutes of the working week, one of those companies goes bankrupt. It's a totally bonkers, bonkers setup, if you think about it. The problem is every now and then one of them does very well. And because every now and then one of them does very well, it encourages everybody else. But the financing, the funding, the running, the whole thing at the end of the day uh, is probably unsustainable, if I'm honest about it, in the long term. And there needs to be more thought about bringing groups of people together to develop new technology and to some extent not keep redeveloping the stuff that we've already got. I talked about NICE. This was a paper I think published in the BMJ last year by Jill Lang, who's the Deputy Chief Executive. And I really came across this fairly recently. This is three technologies uh, with devices that went through technology appraisal. That's very unusual. Technology appraisal almost exclusively deals with medicines. Remember that if TAP gives positive guidelines, there is a commitment by the NHS to fund it. The top left uh, is sort of a thing called gel cytology for doing cervical smears. And once that had been approved, it was shown to be cost-effective, etc., etc., took off, and is now being used virtually 100% of all smears that are done. The top right is coronary stents. And coronary stents are complex because, of course, they've been evolving. So the stents we put in now look nothing like the ones. <coughs> we've had drug eluting, we've had absorbable, we've had edible, we've had, oh, God knows what sort of stents <laughs> that haven't been out there <coughs> in terms of things that we actually put into people. And so I think the reason for that is partly because the technology underneath has been evolving so much. But even so, even you can see that the, the, the uh, red bars are when the advice was given, and this is over the next 10 years. The bottom one, which is uh, various forms of endometrial ablation, either using a, a radio frequency or balloon, um, went through, CE Mart, uh, was approved, was then found to be cost effective, etc., etc., but just never took off. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a gynecologist, so I don't know why particularly, but it's an example that even when you have done all of this, if it isn't what we want, we're not going to use it. Nice in all fairness to it, doesn't really ask the question, is this what we want? It asks the question of, it sort of does, but it sort of says, does it work, is it effective, is it cost effective? But I think we heard from the previous speaker, there is another stage to that, and that to some extent is what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. This is quite an old slide, this is when I was at the MHRA, but uh, these have been repeated. So at the time I was there, about 9,500 adverse incidents. Uh, today, about 17,500 adverse incidents reported. These are all with CE marked devices. This is all post-market. This is not reported during the research phase. Of those device incidents, in only a third did the device go wrong. Very like car accidents. Very few cars today cause car accidents. It's the people driving them. So modern technology, because of the regulations, because of manufacturing, things do go wrong, but that's not common. What does go wrong is either we don't know how to use them because we're poorly trained, and I put my hands up and admit to that, or they're difficult to use. Your car, <coughs> how many of you drive a car? How many of you have read the instruction manual for the car? Well, there's always one sad individual. But I mean, <laughs> so, so but, and also, but you don't. You might do tyre pressures or something, but you don't because you can get in a car and drive it. It's not the same true for medical technology. Not even infusion pumps don't even have a common interface. And imagine having some cars, you turn the wheel that way, and some of them go that way, and some of them go that way. Or the brake pedal's in a different position. And you need to remember which car you're in to work out what to do. And when you look at me, and it's just, he's clearly lost it. He's clearly gone completely bonkers. <laughs> but that's what medical devices look like. And therefore, usability is absolutely key in making safe technology. And I'm going to look at it in two different areas. One is pre-regulatory, and the other is post-regulatory. The pre-regulatory side, which is where my particular interest is in, but I think it runs all the way through device development, uh, has been supported very strongly by the regulators. So 2016, uh, FDA issued this publication. The MHRA consulted for a year and produced an identical document uh, in 2017. Uh, a bit naughty. It wasn't all that different. Really. Um, to say that basically as part of your design process, you must consider usability. It's not yet fully enforced, but if you're in the process of developing technology, I promise you it is coming down the road quickly. You have to show it's safe, you have to show it's effective, you also have to show that real staff can use it. 
And those are important, and it's being enforced. I mean, how it's going to come along and exactly how quickly, I don't know. It's helped by being backed by an international standard. It's part of 60601, so it's under the IEC banner. And 62366, which has undergone a reasonable <coughs> uh, review and also has a technical report to go with it, which is uh, helpful, I think, around it. Don't, for goodness sake, read the whole thing. It's about 130 pages long. But I've, I've summarised it in a few words. Uh, this particular testing should be done pre-regulatory. Having said that, we've recently had a couple of companies have come to us with a product that's been on the market for 10 years. It was CE marked 10 years ago. It's had its CE marked renewed once at the five-year mark. The second five-year mark, the notified body has said no, not until you demonstrate some usability. So it's not all just in the early phase. It's coming. It's coming under the MDR, under clinical evidence review. You run the risk of being asked to consider whether or not you've done some usability. Now, the default position will be that you will have done some. It says it should be done by real staff. <coughs> well, that seems fairly obvious. There's no point getting people never going to use it to try it. In a realistic environment, now that's interesting. So you can't do it in here. If you've got an operating microscope or you've got an operating robot, you can't bring it all in here and do it because this is not the realistic environment. And that's because for many technologies, the environment in which they're used is equally as important as how the actual device works. We've just bought 4,500 infusion pumps. Good order for somebody, that was. 4,500 syringe pumps. And every single nurse that uses them has been sat down around a table and taught how to use them. Every single one. When we take them into ITU and the patients are poorly and everybody's shouting and the blood pressure's going through the floor, bless them, they can't remember how to use it sometimes. They're also very strong. They managed to tear them to pieces. I'm extremely impressed by how a relatively young lady can rip these things to bits. It's actually quite impressive. But it's because of the environment is different. It's because of the environment they're working in. So a realistic environment's interesting. And also not on patients, because these aren't CMI yet. And therefore, really, the whole concept of doing this in simulation starts to get quite interesting. Years ago, I could borrow an operating theatre on a Friday afternoon. I could borrow an intensive care bed. That's all gone. Partly from safeguarding, partly from privacy rules, but really just because they're in use. There aren't empty beds. There aren't empty operating theatres. If the beds are empty, that, you know, <coughs> it's mainly because we don't have nursing staff now. So we thought about, why don't we build our own to test devices in? We could borrow a clinical simulation centre, but they're very busy. So we got the architects to look at the third floor of the old hospital building and look at the east end of it. And I'll show you this beyond pictures. They built a nice area, had very nice toilets, uh, and nice, um, nice offices and so on. It had its own operating theatre, had an area with intensive care, high dependency care, emergency bay, and more recently a pop-up ambulance as well. Just like the real thing, it was built by the team that built the new hospital. It was equipped in exactly the same way as our new hospitals equipped, with exactly the same equipment. It's all absolutely brand new, but solely for device testing. And that's what Europe paid. There was a problem. So three years ago, the floor looked like this. Mm -hmm. So either side of it had been beautifully redone with the business, business innovation and skills money to build the Institute of Translational Medicine, but they didn't do the third floor because there wasn't enough money. So they left it as a building site. The biggest single problem, apart from that someone ripped all the wiring, all the piping and everything out, was the floor. So this is a 1930s hospital. The floor was a layer of vinyl on a layer of concrete on a parquet floor, and the parquet flooring was laid in bitumen and asbestos. <laughs> so the entire floor had to come up down to the steel structure. We were really, really popular with the people working underneath. I can tell you that. It took us about nine months to get this floor. Anyway, 18 months later, a lot of money later, uh, we had a dedicated suite. Top left is an operating theatre. It looks like an operating theatre. It is an operating theatre. It has a couple of pillars that are a bit in the way, but unfortunately they hold another floor up, so we couldn't take those out. Uh, we did two things to prevent the trust from using it. We were quite open about this. We put the wrong air conditioning in, so they can't use it for winter pressures. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, if a bomb went off, sure, we'd, we'd use everything. So we did that. And then we've got a high dependency air, etc. We've got very high quality video. We've got some extremely expensive dollies. Our latest dolly cost me £100,000 for a plastic patient. £100,000. A lot of money for a company to buy, though. But of course, if you only want to come and use it for a few days, then of course, it makes good sense from our perspective. What do we do? We do, essentially, we do usability testing. We'll bring real staff, be they surgeons, anaesthetists, physicians, nursing staff, physios, patients in and ask them to undertake a task. Top left is an anaesthetic device for picking up the right drug. Uh, top right is an ambulance using 5G connection. Bottom left is a new wound dressing. Bottom right is a craniotomy. It looks as real as the real thing. And my final slide, one is to show off. So I spent most of my life showing off. But so two, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we did the world's, world's first 5G connected healthcare application. Okay? This is the second time we did it, which we did in Swansea. So we had a patient, a plastic patient in an ambulance. We ultrasounded their tummy. We sent the live ultrasound video out of the window to a mast a mile away, back in through another window on the 5G network, and then replayed it in real time 
to an emergency, uh, an emergency medicine consultant looking at the ultrasound to assist the paramedic doing the ultrasound in what he was looking at. If you put the two screens together, you can't see the difference in time. The time lag is less than a millisecond. You can't see it. So for the first time in real life, you can send high-definition video over the 5G network and chat to each other and help someone do an ultrasound who could be 100 miles away. We did it in Swansea. And they said, there isn't 5G in Swansea. They said, we know, we've connected it by wire, but you just have to pretend. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the point I want to make, I've talked largely about pre-regulatory stuff and so on and so forth, but I also think, to follow on from the last speaker, there is a huge role for investigating whether your technology will fit into healthcare by simulating its use in healthcare rather than actually protecting patients at risk. And you can do that at all sorts of stages. I think there is an increasing requirement around usability for regulatory approval, so be warned it's coming along, and you need to do it properly. I think that post-market clinical studies do generate real-world evidence without placing patients at risk. They're much cheaper, and I think they're quite attractive. But I would say I think there is a problem in technology adoption in the NHS. And I don't think today we're going to solve it. I think we all have to continue to work together to try and solve that, because otherwise I think we place our patients at risk. Thank you very much indeed.